beautiful day. was walking his beat, and he was scanning the entire area, searching for any potential disruption to the peace. He was so intent, he barely felt this little tug on his coat. And he turned around, and there was a little girl. And he says, can I help you? And she goes, my mama told me that if I ever needed help, I should find a policeman. So all of a sudden, he's alert, and he says, what's wrong? And she stuck out one of her feet, said, can you tie my shoe? <laughs> we would commend that little girl for her fearlessness to go up to the policeman. But that's kind of a rare and specific target in a big, bustling city. We'd be horrified if she approached just any random person with her innocent request, because that would inform potential wrongdoers that at least for the moment, her parents weren't right there at hand. Contrast that sweet story with the news video this week of the toddlers. Did you see a video about toddlers? Uh, they seem a little bigger than toddlers to me, but they're very young children, maybe four to six. And they were cursing and kicking and swinging at a policeman who was on the street. He had come into the neighborhood to arrest the murder suspect. So it's a safe assumption that these children grew up in a house or even a neighborhood where the police were at least hated, if not feared. But recent civic uh, policies are teaching a generation of lawbreakers that they don't have to fear any consequences of their actions because Many DAs and prosecutors in cities aren't even holding violent criminals that the police arrest until trial, just simply letting them go. One of the most popular stickers seen on cars and vans these days says simply, no fear. I hadn't thought about it until preparing for this lesson this morning, but it's just a brand name of uh, sporting and, and motocross wear. We're taught to be ashamed of our fear. We're encouraged to conquer our fears. And I'm not implying there's anything sinister in that, but can't that attitude be taken too far? No fear. <laughs> I'm fearless. Truly, are the wise fearless? And are the fearless wise? What should the role of fear be in our lives? It's obvious that knowledge and wisdom are needed to succeed in life, but oh, the irony. In the first chapter of Proverbs, we're told the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. The fear of the Lord. But fools despise wisdom and discipline. Now, we studied wisdom recently, but we didn't get into the source of wisdom like we will today. Academia is full of Bible professors who don't believe that the Bible is the Word of God. And the world is full of educated fools. The Bible describes the mindset where these revelations of Scripture crystallize into believing acceptance. And that mindset is described as the fear of the Lord. The fear of the Lord. That theme runs through Proverbs. It's foundational to Job and is prominent in Psalms. Proverbs 8.13. You're going to get a lot of scripture in this one. <laughs> the fear of the Lord is to hate evil. Pride and arrogance and the evil way and the perverted mouth I hate. Job 28.28. And to man he said... Behold, the fear of the Lord, that is wisdom. The fear of the Lord is wisdom. And to, and to depart from evil is understanding. Fear of the Lord is mentioned 18 times in Proverbs. Now, when you see anything in any document 18 times, you know it's important. 
But the book of Proverbs stresses its importance in relationship to wisdom. And that means the fear of the Lord is essential in the lives of Christians. In fact, over and over, Scripture commands the fear of the Lord. So let's read more of these verses and see if this required fear of the Lord demands that we always be afraid of God. Here are two verses which add to the benefits of this fear. Proverbs 14, 27. The fear of the Lord is a fountain of life by which one may avoid the snares of death. Well, I want some of that fear. In Proverbs 15, 33, the fear of the Lord is the instruction for wisdom. And before honor comes humility. But before we can understand all this, we need to explore what the Bible means by fear. The word translated fear actually has several meanings. It can refer to the terror of those in the wrong, as in Deuteronomy 2.25, this very day I will begin to put the terror and fear of you, the Israelites, on all the nations under heaven. They will hear reports of you and will tremble in anguish because of you. It can also indicate deep respect, as in Joshua 24.14. Now, therefore, fear the Lord and serve him in sincerity and truth. Fear can indicate the reverence and awe due the King of Kings. As Isaiah 6 5 relates, Woe to me, I cried, I am ruined, for I am a man of unclean lips, and I live among a people of unclean lips, and my eyes have seen the King, the Lord Almighty. <clears throat> The fear of the Lord combines all these strands. The fear of the Lord rests upon us as a persistent awareness that our Maker knows our every thought, our every utterance, and every action of our lives. This is stressed in Matthew 12, 36. But I tell you that for every careless word that people speak, they will give an account for it on the day of judgment. And in Psalm 139, 2, you know when I sit and when I rise, you perceive my thoughts from afar. And as powerful as any other verse on this topic, but you know me, Lord, you see me, and examine my heart, my heart's attitude toward you. This is part of Jeremiah's prayer regarding his concern about the wicked. It's found in Jeremiah 12, 3. That's not all of the verse. We'll finish it in a moment. In a moment. But earlier he writes, Righteous are you, O Lord, that I would plead my case with you. Indeed, I would discuss matters of justice with you. Why has the way of the wicked prospered? Why are all those who deal in treachery at ease. I know, that's something that occurs to us sometimes daily. Scripture promises his prayer will finally and completely be answered. And verse 3 finishes with this. Drag them off like sleep sheep for the slaughter and set them apart for a day of slaughter. Are not each of us wicked in our own ways? Yes, fear deserves a place at the table. The wise fear and obey God. But this fear isn't just one of many qualities of the wise. It's foundational to their wisdom. The wise person builds a relationship with God. But, and they build this on the rock of faithful knowledge of Christ. Yet the fools despise God. They won't be told what to do. How will the fool then ever accumulate wisdom? They revile the Lord. And that they revile the Lord is seen in their destructive actions. The voice of wisdom proclaims, To fear the Lord is to hate evil. 
I hate pride and arrogance, evil behavior, and perverse speech. Living wisely, we make her words our own. Fearing God will avoid all evil things. More than that, we will hate evil things. But the one who doesn't fear God won't hate evil. Oh, they'll hate some things that are evil. They'll hate the drive-by killing of children on the street. But they may hardly endorse the killing of children in doctor's offices. The list of things God hates grows ever longer because men are constantly inventing new ways of doing evil. Romans 1.30 the Lord knows us, and he hates the things we accept in others and the things we'll accept in ourselves. To fear the Lord is to hate evil. I hate pride and arrogance, evil behavior, and perverse speech. But do we hate these evils in ourselves? So yes, we need wisdom. But without the fear of the Lord, we will never have it. We won't find it in any of these cute books that are sold in bookstores on the special little rack and each one's got a provocative title or got this thick and they've got several pages of interesting artwork and a few pithy sayings that someone's come up with. You won't find wisdom there. But there's another problem with this generation. A practice that's been so, become so common outside the church that it's sometimes having an influence inside the church. And that's this generation's desire to define God as they wish. We actually touched on this a little bit in the, uh, in the uh, Bible class this morning. Some even go to the blasphemous extreme of defining themselves as gods in their own eyes. And why not? They want a God that thinks as they do. They want a deep clawed, defanged, pussycat of a God. So of course, there's no fear of a cosmic vending machine that winks at sin and disperses blessings on demand. But eventually, even the worst blasphemers will wise up. Each one of them will appear before our Lord for judgment, and there they will finally fear the Lord. Our God is a dangerous God. Our God is the Lion of the tribe of Judah. But in the meantime, Worldly fearlessness is foolishness. Whether it's based on ignorance or ignorance of what God proclaims about himself in Scripture. The foolish of this world must not wait until they're in front of the throne of God where every knee will bend before the awesome power of God. Hebrews 3.13 commands of believers, encourage one another daily as long as it's called today, so that none of you may be hardened by sin's <coughs> deceitfulness. We should also encourage the non-believers with Proverbs 19.23, which says, The fear of the Lord leads to life. Then one rests content, untouched by trouble. Psalm 103 puts it this way, For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his love for those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far as he removed our transgressions from us. As a father has compassion on his children, so the Lord has compassion on those who fear him. When we fear God, there's great news. There's nothing else to fear. When we fear God, what else? could we possibly fear? God loves those who fear him wisely. And because God loves us and has compassion on us, nothing else can touch us. Proverbs 3, 23 through 26 promises, Then you will walk in your way securely, and your foot will not stumble. When you lie down, you will not be afraid. When you lie down, your sleep will be sweet. Do not be afraid of sudden danger, nor of trouble from the wicked men when it comes. For the Lord will be your confidence, and he will keep your foot from being caught. 
I want to close with another man's story that reminds me of my father. He tells it like this. When I was a boy, we had a dog named Trixie. She was a beautiful beagle. She was a joy to be around. My brothers and sisters and I loved Trixie. We'd spend hours playing with her whenever we could because she was our dog and she loved us as much as we loved her. But Trixie wasn't allowed in the house. She had to stay down in the basement because Dad wouldn't allow dogs in the house. But every once in a while, Trixie would sneak up, but Dad would catch her, swat her on the behind, and either send her back to the basement or toss her outside. Dad was never really unkind to Trixie, but if he was bad, he'd punish her. And you could tell that Trixie always feared our father. He was the hand of judgment in her life. She was always cautious around Dad. One night there was a terrible storm lighting up the night. Thunder rattled the windows. Mom and Dad were in bed almost asleep when something bounded into the bed and huddled next to Dad. It was Trixie. And Trixie hadn't jumped onto Mom's side of the bed, hadn't come to me or my sisters. Why? Because Dad was big enough to protect her. She may have feared him, but in the storm, she knew that he would protect her. Can't we fear God in a similar way? As we grow in understanding of his power and his resolute demands on us, who we can never fulfill, but also as we grow in wisdom and obedience, worshipfully loving him too, and confidently cherishing his promises to save us in his mercy instead of destroying us in his rightful judgment. Happily, the word of God doesn't restrict our relationship with God to one of fear. Have I been giving you a one-sided picture? I want to clear that up now. God's word doesn't limit us in our divine relationships to fear of the Lord. He goes on to describe the peak experience of faithfully living in Christ here in the world. One of the climaxes of Jesus' teaching to his disciples and his followers was this. Fear not, for I am always with you. What could be more comforting? What could be more encouraging? So yes, fear the Lord when you contemplate sinning, when you face temptation, but be thrilled, thrilled at the wisdom you will gain as you grow in Christ. It is God will, God's will that we live joyfully in the security that we have in our Lord and Savior. And finally, 1 John 4, 18 and 19 explains how we can fear the Lord without being afraid. It goes like this. There is no fear in love, but perfect love, there's something for us to aspire to, but perfect love drives out all fear. Because fear involves punishment. The one who fears has not been perfected in love. We love because he first loved us. There is anyone this morning who feels they want that security and that love and wants to grow into the fearlessness that perfect love gives? Please come forward as we have a song invitation. You can become baptized, your sins forgiven. You will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Walk in newness with power against the temptations of this life and the threats of the world, and truly live fearlessly for the rest of your days. Please come forward as we have a song.